everybody, let's just get this out of the way. The revival era was just the string of films Disney needed after the experimental era's varying successes and failures. And while they did stop making 2D films here, they at least got the hang of 3D animation, leading to some stellar looking films. But was Super Mario 3D World really the best Mario game? Was Super Smash Bros. for Wii U really the best Smash Bros.? The point is, the revival era didn't really have that much substance, as opposed to the renaissance and the classics that make them worth going back to in comparison, alongside some films having more glaring flaws than others. And as for the Smash hit film of that era, it was either that or just in the Knights of Valor. You could definitely make the argument we're still in the revival era, but I think these films are so jarringly different in terms of quality, I reckon they're worth discussing on their own, so treat this video as more so a part 2 if you want to. So now, let's start wallowing in Disney's current periods of mediocrity with Ralph Breaks the Internet, I am already regretting my career choices. A sequel to Wreck-It Ralph, and it starts off in the arcade six years after the first movie, and we see Ralph hanging out with Vanellope, being the best of friends. Whilst Ralph is happy with how things are, Vanellope is starting to get bored of racing all the time and lust for something new. In the morning, the owner plugs in a Wi-Fi router, as everyone becomes curious about it, and it gets locked off. Speedy McSpeedy here then explains to everyone about the plug bringing in the internet. Why am I not surprised that Sonic's the one explaining how the internet works? During a race in Sugar Rush, Ralph creates a new track for Vanellope as she causes the wheel of the game to break outside. Now I've heard of Joy-Con Druid, but I don't think I've ever seen a video game character purposefully gain sentience against a player breaking hardware outside. After some kids show the owner a pricey replacement wheel on eBay, he decides to put the game out of order and sell it for parts. Everyone gets out of the game, with Vanellope now homeless. Whilst Felix and Calhoun decide to raise the racers, making me question how these video game characters even do it. It's already hard enough figuring out how Yoshi and Birdo kiss. Surely this will be a fun B story. It's never brought up again until the last three minutes of the movie. When it tappers, Ralph realizes that he can get the wheel off eBay through the internet, and Felix states he'll cover him in the game while he's gone. Why is he okay with this? Didn't his game almost get unplugged because of this? With that, Ralph and Vanellope then head up to the Wi-Fi router, now going to the internet. They reach it, and after asking a search engine, they head to eBay and win the auction for the wheel. Six! Nine! Thirteen! Thirteen's not good! Fourteen! Fourteen! But they need to get $27,001 within 24 hours to pay for it, or else they won't get it. I'm already questioning how this even works. Like, does the arcade owner pay for it? Like, how the hell would these video game characters from 1982 gather up a small sum of money, let alone $27,001? They then follow Get Rich Quick Spam and is instructed to find a car in the online game Slaughter Race worth 40 grand. They then go there to steal the car, but they get chased by its main character, Shank. She's impressed by Vanellope's racing and makes a viral video of Ralph as Vanellope becomes intrigued by the game's excitement and unpredictability. The two then get a notification from E-Boy here that they have 8 hours to get the money. They now go to BuzzTube to see Ralph's video blow up in popularity. They see the head algorithm, and when learning that you can profit from videos, they pump out HILARIOUS videos with Ralph doing all kinds of silly things and trends, because they've got to have money. Don't put memes in your animated movies that take years to make. They had the lifespan of an insect. But they still need more money. With three hours remaining. Hey, how did they pump out this much content within five hours on top of getting millions of views? Does anything in this movie make sense? The algorithm sends out pop-up ads of Ralph, with Vanellope also joining with Ralph directing her to Oh My Disney. Oh My Disney indeed. This definitely doesn't feel like a glorified ad of the company. You must be out of your mind! She then gets chased by stormtroopers and hides stumbling across the princesses, who all translate into 3D really well. She quickly befriends them and is advised to get a want song for her true desires. Meanwhile, Ralph continues trying to profit from his videos, but stumbles across some mean comments, learning that the internet isn't such a friendly place after all. Be very lucky that this is a kid's movie, Ralph. Otherwise, there'll be a whole load of swear words. 
but the algorithm tells him he has just enough money to pay off the wheel. We cut back to Vanalpi now singing her one song to be in Slaughter Race, in a pretty fun tribute to the older films. But there is one little problem I'm convinced the writers forgot about. Vanalpi's going turbo. Wasn't that like, you know, the whole conflict of the first movie, that game jumping was practically illegal? At least there, Ralph just wanted a dumb medal, whereas Vanalpi is now considering leaving her own game behind, which she's on the cabinet of no less. It's all well and good letting people have different dreams from one another, but the rules that movie established makes it impossible for this to work. Isn't Ralph also going turbo? Yeah, but he's not getting away scot-free either, as throughout the film, he's been acting overly protective towards Penelope with what she wants to do and what he thinks is best for her, wanting to hang out with her all the time. And it's honestly kind of creepy at points, especially when you take into account their age gap. Amazing, Rob's an overly needy crybaby and Vanalpi's a backstabbing traitor to everything the original movie stood for. All we need now is for Fixit Felix to mutate into Godzilla and then the Holy Trinity will be complete. As Ralph tells Vanalpi he bought the wheel, he overhears Vanalpi discussing with Shank about staying in Slaughter Race. This gets to Ralph as he heads to the dark web, getting a virus to slow down the game. He does so, but the virus detects Vanalpi, causing the whole game to glitch. Ralph gets her out, and as he slips about how he puts in the virus, Vanalpi becomes mad, destroying his medal. Well, great job being a caring and supportive friend, Ralph Fitrek. The virus then detects Ralph as an insecurity, creating thousands of him, wreaking havoc on the internet, and grabs Vanalpi, climbing up a building King Kong style. I have to say, I am really impressed with how they animated thousands of these Ralphs as one big creature. Ralph takes it on, and comes to realize that he should let Vanalpi pursue her dreams. My god, it took you this long?! With that, the Ralphs vanish, and the princesses come in to save Ralph falling from a good height. Ralph then bids Vanalpi farewell, as he lets her go into slaughter race without bearing in mind what will happen to Sugar Rush whatsoever. With that, Ralph at home now heads to Zongi's book club and dinner parties hosted by other video games, and we also see that Felix and Calhoun did a good job at racing the Sugar Rush racers. And ultimately, Ralph and Vanalpi keep in touch via phone calls. We get two after credit scenes of Ralph and Vanalpi in a mobile game, and a Frozen 2 teaser with Ralph rickrolling us. Okay, that's pretty awesome. No wonder they call him wreck -It Ralph. He just wrecked his own franchise! The world building makes no sense. Felix and Calhoun's side story of raising the racers plays such a small role in the film that it might as well not be here. Though the film has a really good message of letting your friends pursue their dreams, even if you drift apart as a result, it is butchered by the film's execution, and with the amount of dead memes shown off alongside appearances of the likes of the Twitter bird and cancelled internet celebrities, this roughly half a decade old film already didn't age well. Now this movie already wasn't hot, but as a sequel to Wreck-It Ralph, it's even worse! The characters were practically massacred, the internet setting does not work for these characters, and it goes against everything the original movie stood for. Man, what a spit in the face! And with the amount of self-promotion and product placement, this film is now starting to remind me of Space Jam 2. And if you remind me of Space Jam 2, you screwed up! Unlike the first movie being one of Disney's best, this is one of their worst. But on a positive note, at least this is their best film with Ariel in it. Okay, now that I covered Ralph Breaks the Internet, I should now review Frozen 2. It only makes sense as that is next in the canon and is very popular. Does that mean I'll watch the movie? Well, <laughs> my answer is... No! Yeah, I'm putting my foot down on this one. I refuse to watch this movie. I already explicitly said so in the past. I'm now opening myself up to reviewing every film of the Disney animated canon. Except for Frozen 2, because that movie was only made for money. Then you'll have to review Frozen 2. No. This is why you should follow me on Blue Sky. Remember when James Rolfe explained why he wouldn't watch the 2016 Ghostbusters reboot? The reasons there more or less apply here. This movie was made for money, rather than expanding upon the first one. Yeah, isn't every sequel ever made for money? In some ways, yes, but even you could tell Disney were riding off the hype train from the first movie, with merchandise, theme park rides, short films, and now a feature-length follow-up made to associate it. Why would I waste my precious time watching something 
I know I don't think warrants existing, and when watching the trailers, it really doesn't justify its point of being made, making me think the filmmakers didn't care enough about naturally fleshing out the world building of the original, thinking that they could get away with it, as they imagined that we, the audience, were dumb enough to let the film do incredibly well at the box office, regardless of the efforts put into making this film, just because it's that Olaf in it. And the worst part was that I was right. It did better than the first movie, grossing just under one and a half billion dollars. Walt Disney Animation Studios is better than this. The closest I ever got to seeing this film was reading the plot on Wikipedia, watching the CinemaSins video, and listening to someone singing into the unknown in a toad voice. And damn it, I'm gonna keep it that way. I don't give a rat's ass if it's the greatest movie ever made, nor if it's the worst. Nothing is going to change my mind. So with that, let it be known that I, Ed, the DK Mountain Enthusiast Bartlett, will never review Frozen 2. Make that three movies I'll never review. It's weird, I'll watch that, yet yeah, this is where I draw the line. And now for Ryan the Last Dragon. We begin in Kamandra, where dragons used to roam around the land, but soon vanished with no help from the Droon turning everything in its sight into stone. With the last dragon Sisu creating an orb, fending them off, containing the last bits of dragon power being at the center. Commander is now separated into five factions, as in the heart, Raya, after some training with her father, is now put in charge of guarding the orb. The other tribes come over, as Raya befriends Namaria, the Fang tribe, who are both interested in dragons. Raya then trusts her enough to take her to see the orb, and what do you think happens next? The tribes all fight for the orb, which breaks into five pieces. Each tribe has a piece, and the Druun come in to turn some of the people there into stone, including Raya's father, with her now on her own. Six years pass, with Raya grown, now in the tail faction. She then summons Sisu, voiced by Aquafina. And let me tell you, she is no Robin Williams as the genie. It turns out that she isn't the sharpest tool in the shed compared to her other dragon peers. After a piece of the crystal gives Sisu some new powers, they head to a booby-trapped cave with a piece of the orb. There, Raya comes across Namari, also wanting the piece, with it turning Sisu into a human. One chase later, they reach a boy in a boat, who they get a ride with. As he explains that his family got consumed by the Droon, and Raya learning to trust him, they approach the Talon faction. Raya heads to find the piece, coming across a baby and Orangis, who steal from her. Meanwhile, Sisu gets the wrong impression of the monetary system, coming across an old woman. As Raya catches up with the baby, she then helps her sneak in to get the piece but the owner is turned into stone. We cut back to Sisu, and the old woman just happens to have the piece, leaving Sisu with the Droon. But Raya comes in to save her and grab the piece. The baby and Ongis also come aboard with everyone trusting them, now heading to the Spine Faction. They get trapped by the sole survivor, and take a guess at what happens next. Namari and her army also pop by, with Raya briefly taking her on, as the rest escape, and Namari sees Sisu. On the boat, Sisu now has the power to fly again, and takes Raya to the Heart Faction, where she tells her about how the dragons entrusted her with the orb to fend off the Droon. I think this movie's trying to tell us something. With that, Raya then heads to the Fang Faction to give back Namari a dragon bracelet she gave her six years ago. Namari and Raya meet in private to give them the last piece of the orb, hoping they can trust one another. But there's 30 minutes left of this movie as Namari shoots Sisu. With the last dragon dead, the water runs out as the Droon now bring Doom to the land. As everyone evacuates, Raya comes in to take on the Mari. They fight, but then help everyone evacuate from the Droon. Just as the orb's power dies down, the Mari puts it back together, whilst Raya, her crew, and then the Mari get consumed by the Droon, and with that, everyone dies. The end. But it's kids movie law to finish with a happy ending as the orb's power comes back not only bringing back the people consumed by the Droon, but also the dragons, including Sisu. Raya now gets along with Namari as a crew reunites with their families, and Raya sees her father for the first time in six years. The tribes all gather at the Heart Faction as Kamandra is now reunited. I don't know about this one, the land of Kamandra itself is pretty intriguing and well laid out, some fight scenes are cool, and the animation is fantastic. But it's a Disney movie, that's like saying water is wet. The story was beyond by the numbers, the characters weren't too interesting, Aquafina as Sisu was admittedly pretty annoying, 
and it doesn't have the greatest message of blind trust, not held by how much they bang on about it throughout the film. Like, it would not shut up about it! You should trust more people, they seem cool, you should trust them, I've changed now, you should trust me, you can always depend on the kindness of strangers, trust me, 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 You get it! While I wouldn't call Ryan the Last Dragon outright bad per se, I certainly wouldn't call it good either. Next is Encanto, which serves as the studio's 60th film. We start in Colombia with a flashback of a fleeing group of people where a man then sacrifices himself, but his wife's candle then glows up creating a magical house hiding them. Many years pass as the house grows with the woman's children and their children having special abilities known as gifts. We get a song led by Mirabal here who goes over her family and their gifts. She herself doesn't have a gift and a boy named Antonio is about to receive his. The ceremony takes place as Mirabel helps Antonio head up to his new room, whilst we also see flashbacks of Mirabel's failed ceremony. Antonio then gets the gift of talking to animals. Everyone celebrates in his new room as Mirabel sings about how she wants to fit in with her family. She then sees cracks outside and tells everyone, but they vanish. Mirabel, have you ever read The Insider of Cried Switch 2? The next day, she tries talking to Lisa about the cracks, who has the gift of strength. She sings about feeling pressured regarding her family, and now starts to feel anxious as she tells Mirabel about a mysterious family member named Bruno, who has the gift of seeing the future, and directs her to his room to find out more. Mirabel climbs up his room and sees mysterious broken up shards. She picks them up as she narrowly escapes the room crumbling down, whilst we also see the house's magic dying down with Lisa now weak. When putting them together, she sees herself in the vision, whilst some family members sing about Bruno's gift being a bad omen, going over why they don't talk about Bruno. I am really sorry to any parents watching this video. Mirabel then sees the vision of the house crumbling with her in front, her father comes in and sees the vision, with the two keeping it secret, but Dolores, who has the gift of strong hearing, also finds out. At a proposal dinner for Isabella, Dolores whispers to everyone about what she heard, leading to fun mishap, a failed proposal, and everyone finding out about the vision, with the house getting more cracks. Maribel sees some rats go in the walls, as she follows them to find Bruno living in the walls all this time. And it turns out he's not as sinister as the song made him out to be. He reveals that the vision could go in two ways, with the house either destroyed or not. In Antonio's room, Bruno creates a new vision showing that Mirabel should hug things out with Isabella. She heads up to her, who confesses about being tired of being perfect with making flowers creating a cactus, where she sings about her new abilities bonding with Mirabel. Abuela is then angry about this, as she and Mirabel fight, causing the house to collapse. Whilst everyone makes it out, Mirabel gets the candle, but it dies down with the house destroyed, and everyone losing their gifts. This causes Mirabel to run off, and when alone at a river, Abuela pops over, tonguing out her past with falling in love with her husband and then fleeing with their children, leading to the house being made with the candle. The two now come to terms with each other as Bruno comes across Abuela for the first time in years and they all head back home. Bruno gets reintroduced to the family as they alongside everyone in town rebuild the house. Mirabel inserts the front doorknob as everyone now gets back their gifts, and the house is now magical again with everyone celebrating. What the heck? I like this movie? No, I love this movie! The characters are investing, with their gifts making them that more appealing, the film tells a strong and compelling story, the song lineup is phenomenal, and the popularity it got thankfully didn't spoil for me like Frozen's did, as I was busy with another brilliant film score that year, and this could possibly be the best looking animated film I have ever seen. We have come a long way from Chicken Little. It may not be my all-time favorite Disney movie, but this is still a damn good take on the musical Disney formula, and excellent addition to the animated canon. Now for Strange World, which marks the first film to use a new logo for Disney to commemorate its 100th anniversary, and I can already say this is the best part of the movie. We get introduced to an adventurer named Jaeger Clade alongside his son Searcher. During an expedition in the mountains, Searcher comes across a plant filled with energy named Panto, as he and his team head home with Jaeger further finding what's beyond the mountains. 
25 years pass, as Jaeger is long missing, while Searcher revolutionizes energy consumption with Panto, and is now living a peaceful life in his farm with his wife Meridian, Pet Dog Legend, and son Ethan, who happens to lust for adventure and have a crush on his friend Diazzo. After Searcher cramps his son's style and briefly heads to town in Avalonia, a ship pops over with an old friend of Searcher telling him that the plants are dying, asking him to venture to the source. With that, Searcher heads to the ship alone, but also stumbles across Ethan and Meridian as the ship heads underground. Some creatures attack it, as everyone now crashes into an unknown land, with Searcher and Legend separated from the ship. As everyone with the ship stays put, Ethan heads out to find his father. Searcher then stumbles across some dangerous creatures, but a mysterious figure comes in to save him, revealing to be Jaeger. After some catching up, they start heading towards the ship. Meanwhile, Ethan on his own comes across a blue creature he names Splat, who most likely exists for merchandising, taking him to his doom. They all gather up as Searcher and Jaeger bicker while running for their lives. The crew come in just in time, heading back to the ship. There, Jaeger now cleans himself up, as Ethan discusses to him about Diazzo, as Searcher worries about his son becoming his father. I gotta say, this generational trauma conflict isn't the greatest fit for this kind of film. It was fine for Encanto as that was a down-to-earth family drama that just happened to take place in a magic house. Here we had this... <clears throat> Strange role to explore, but instead go for this conflict that can be done anywhere, undervaluing the film setting as a result. With Searcher feeling that Jaeger wasn't the best father and that he tries to be a better one with Ethan, and now he's taking an interest with Jaeger, blech. One pointless scene of the boys playing cards later, they start seeing a trail of vines and follow it, while some creatures help get the ship through in the Cedic area. With that, they now reach the center of the vines, with the creatures attacking it. They all take it on, electrocuting them, and as Searcher and Ethan get into a fight about Ethan's desires in life, they finally see what's past the mountains, seeing the ocean, and also a giant creature, realizing that Panda was hurting it. As they head back to tell everyone, the crew lock Searcher, Meridian, and Ethan as they fend out the creatures, but Splat and Legend help them escape. With that, Searcher now heads down to the heart to get rid of the Panda, with help from Jaeger, as Meridian shows everyone the heart Panda is hurting. Searcher finally digs in the plant as the creatures now go inside breaking Pando, as the heart grew three sizes that day. As they all head out, Jaeger finally sees what's beyond the mountains. One year later, Ethan is now staying underground with his friends as he gets together with Diazzo, Avalonia just without Pando, and Jaeger is now helping out on his son's farm as we close out with it all taking place on a giant turtle. Can it grant you the powers of the Avatar? Asking for a friend. This film was fine. It had decent and creative world building, especially when you take into account the choice of it all being on a giant living creature that could have been revealed earlier on. The conflicts were fine. It has really good animation in the world, alongside the stylized shots. And while it's really welcome to see an openly gay character in these movies, they could have gone further with that representation, like let them kiss for crying out loud. But ultimately, this film could have done with the villain that doesn't care about hurting the planet to more effectively bring home the film's environmentally friendly messages, as the generational trauma stuff does not do the setting that much justice. Can we get a visual of who said villain would look like? There we go. Other than that, this film just comes off as a poor man's Atlantis, so Strange World is just okay. And with how these films have been going, it's a damn miracle. Finally, Wish, which celebrates the 100th anniversary of Disney's founding the year it released. I would have made a review of this when it came out a year ago, but I had priorities. Now, I thought this one was pretty mediocre when it released, but it's so much worse upon rewatch. It starts in the Kingdom of Rosas, founded by a great wish-granting sorcerer named King Magnifico. We meet Dasha alongside her mother and grandfather, who's turning 100. Oh, like the studio's 100th anniversary. You're not very clever, you know that? We get acquainted with Rosa's and Asha's eerily familiar friends as she heads up to an interview with King Magnifico. She gets along with him well, but when asking him to fulfill her grandfather's wish, he hesitates worrying that it would cause a rebellion finding out that Magnifico likes playing favorites for wishes. What?! 
He just wants to play a dumb instrument. He's not gonna start a revolution at this age, and you have the power to grant wishes. Like, your entire kingdom is depending on you to make their wishes come true. So fulfill their f***ing wishes. This makes Asha suspicious of him as he hosts a wish-granting ceremony and doesn't give Asha the job. At home, she explains to everyone about what she saw and then storms off as she sings about wishing for a better life. This causes a star to come down, throwing off Magnifico. Asha then discovers the star as it gives off some magic, now making the goat talk becoming an annoying side character. I owe Gurgi and Sisu a huge apology right now. They then get a song from the animals, explaining that it's a star, as if it already wasn't obvious enough. Why does the bear look like it came out of Over the Hedge? And before we move on, let's address the phone's references and easter eggs. I get why they're doing this as the special centennial film, but I think they got a bit carried away with these. They are so in your face and even distracting at points. You know you screwed up when I was more invested in finding these than I am with the film's shallow plot. Like look, the credits are just like Snow White. Asha's friends are a lot like the Seven Dwarves. Asha's preparing to be the Sorcerer's Apprentice. The trees are alive like that silly symphony short. This woman wants to fly with Peter here. Look, that there's named Bambi. There are not cleverly subtle nods to the studio's past films. If anything, they make me wish I was watching those instead. <laughs> to give the Mario movie credit, at least its references never got in the way of the film's story. And what makes these that more unnecessary is that Disney already made a film commemorating their past with Once Upon a Studio. That was perfect for everything it needed to accomplish, a nice look back at the studio's history with all their characters coming together. Imagine getting bested by a 9 minute short film that's also a bonus on your Blu-ray release, that's embarrassing. Asha alongside the star and goat heads up to the castle, and as her friends find out about it, they help stall Magnifico as she heads up to retrieve her grandfather's wish. Now we get to her villain. It's been a while since we've had a proper villain in these movies. No more shoddily executed twist villains, nor generational trauma consisting of Ooh, I hate my dad, he never took me to Legoland! <laughs> no more of that crap. Instead, we now have a traditional evil villain with King Magnifico. And guess what? He sucks. The townsfolk ask him valid questions about their wishes, which then makes him sing his villain song and embrace forbidden magic becoming evil, as Asha and the star narrowly grab her grandfather's wish. Jeez, what a little crybaby. You gonna cry all day, crybaby? Now I will just say that the hate surrounding this is the things I get is a bit overblown. But I'm not necessarily defending the sequence either. For starters, it's better than every song from The Little Mermaid combined, so there's that. Magnifico's turn to evil does not make any sense after all the questions he got. I'd understand if this were over time, say like the Joker, but his people literally started asking him about their wishes, and that's his breaking point of no return to being evil, while also destroying their wishes to make a staff? My god, not even Anakin Skywalker is this petty when he joined the dark side. He then puts up a bounty for who stole some wishes. You could say there's an imposter among us. No! I deserve that. No! Asha heads home with her family, finding out about the star, and gives the grandfather his wish. Magnifico pops over destroying her mother's wish, as Asha and her family make a run for it. But she decides to head back. She sees one of her friends become a knight for Magnifico, as she sends a message to the queen to meet her through a mouse. Asha and her friends meet up in secret, seeing how they can take down Magnifico with the Queen tagging along. The Queen lures Magnifico to chase Asha in the forest as her friends go in to free the wishes, whilst the star makes a wand for Asha. But it turns out that Magnifico was actually his knight and that he never left. He traps the wishes and the star as Asha heads back with the animals taking care of the knight. Asha comes to stop Magnifico as he traps everyone, but Asha sings standing up to him with everyone else following. That's it. That's the climax. The star and wishes are free, and Magnifico is now trapped in his staff in a mirror. The queen now takes charge of Rosas, as the goat plans to open up a zoo metropolis. Oh, very clever. The star plans to leave, and now makes a new one for Asha, granting people's wishes, becoming a fairy godmother. We get the credits featuring artwork from the majority of the studio's film backlog. 
I can guarantee you there would have been rides if Jim Hawkins wasn't here. And we get an after credit scene of the old man playing When You Wish Upon a Star- Oh, screw off! You didn't earn this! Seeing Ichabod and the Yo-Yo Flamingo from Fantasia 2000 during the credits was unironically the best part of the whole film. Man, talk about a way to piss out! The characters were lean, the animation looks unfinished, King Magnifico is a pathetic excuse for a villain, calling the story generic would be an understatement, the songs were mostly forgettable, I hate the goat, the references were distracting, and above all, it has nothing going for it. At least Ralph Briggs the Internet had a good message buried beneath its horse shit. At least the Black Cauldron had strong art direction despite its bad story and characters. At least Chicken Little's stupidity can be enjoyed ironically. It's better than these. Yeah, so is the Emoji Movie. This is just dumb nonsense only really young kids can enjoy. And they frankly deserve better than this. So with that, which is a failure in filmmaking and Disney's way of celebrating their centennial. And the worst part of all, there was to beat the Robinson's character during the credits! Do you know who you're dealing with? <laughs> I want this film to be my pole bearer for when I die. Just so it could let me down one last time. And that was... Uh, whatever the hell this current era for Disney was. And I think we're now on the worst string of films from Walt Disney Animation Studios since... I want to say the wartime era. The Bronze Age, despite liking the magic of Walt's prior work, still had a consistently good batting average for the most part. And the experimental era's highs at the very least made up for its lows. Here, we only got like one great movie, whilst the others are polarizing at best. And with how this line has been going, day after day, I'm more convinced that said great film was greenlit by accident. I really think Disney needs to heed this advice. Take more risks with your films. The problem with this era was that these films played it too safe. Handing in unique art styles and or strong themes can go a long way and appeal to numerous audiences like the older films did come up with more original stories instead of milking your IPs dry. You'll soon see how important this tip is. Make 2D films again. That's the reason why Disney became so beloved in the first place. Treasure Planet, The Princess and the Frog, and Once Upon a Studio are great proof that 2D can work in the modern age of animation. I think a new Fantasia movie would be great for this. But whatever you do, don't make another Winnie the Turd movie. And I ultimately think that everyone working at Disney really need to watch the likes of Spider-Man Into and Across the Spider-Verse, Puss in Boots The Last Witch, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, Nimona, and The Wild Robot just to get a taste of where the animation industry is going. Because right now, you're losing to Illumination, let's be honest. We will see the studio have a great era again, but I think it's going to take some time before they get out of this weird period, and until then, here's hoping for the best. And let me tell you, I am not looking forward to reviewing Moana 2. If I had rank all films covered from worst to best except for Frozen 2 because that movie was only made for money, it would be Wish, Ralph Breaks the Internet, Ryan the Last Dragon, Strange World, and Encanto. Have you seen any of these films? And if you did, what you think of them? Let me know down below. And with that, thanks for watching.